In the previous episode, our war council declared war on the Vlandians. They are the biggest kingdom besides our own, so this will not be an easy war. We spend a few days preparing our troops and head southwest. Our first sighting of the enemy is a small detachment of 400 troops, probably on their way to raid our villages. We corner them in the mountains and leave no survivors. It was a massacre at only 42 losses and a 10 to 1 KDR. With so few losses, it's not difficult to sustain our numbers through prisoner recruitment. We keep only a handful of tier 5 and tier 6 troops and top off after each battle. Finally, we reach level 250, two-handed, and take the final perk. It doesn't do much now, but each level above 250 will help a lot. For our first war goal, we will take back the empire-cultured castle of Thraktore. It was recently taken and has a token defense of 80 troops. A quick aside, if we want to get into the castle quickly, it can be done. We need to rush the ladder, hold a high guard, and get away from the defenders quickly. Once they stop targeting us, we can re-engage or roam the interior for a better position. We take the castle at a cost of 14 of our finest. Post-battle, we recruit 64 of their prisoners and distribute them into our companions' parties. We spend a few days resting and collecting more troops and head towards Sargo under the cover of darkness only to run into the Vlandian vanguard. This army represents roughly 15% of their total strength and probably closer to 40% or more of their field troops. So while it's a big risk for us to take the fight, it would be crippling for them to lose it. The Asurai got tired of paying tribute and declared war on us. We cannot afford to fight on two fronts, so we pay 5100 dinars per day and 650 influence to broker the peace deal. They decide to seize down Thraktore in an attempt to take it back. We luck out and reinforcements show up on our side. At this point, they should have given up and retreated, but instead they assault the castle and take on casualties. There are over 200 troops in the garrison, which means they can easily trade two to three times that amount. At 900 troops, they give up the siege and get sandwiched. We outnumber them more than two to one now, but that doesn't mean it will be an easy battle. We sit up on the hill overlooking a small valley. Because we have plenty of crossbows, we can reach their lines at a great distance. The cavalry on their right flank are exposed and outmatched by our cavalry, so we push forward to meet up head on. Soldiers! Right before the lines meet, we give the charge command. Not more than a minute later, their flank is reduced to three cavalry. The AI likes to rebalance their formations, so once we destroy their flank, they will shift half from the other side over, essentially feeding our hungry cavalry detachment. RIP Imperial Recruit. We reposition our infantry and are ready to deliver the knockout blow. We take a bolt right through the heart and go down, but more than half of their army is gone and the weight of our army is bearing down upon them. The casualties are near even, although we will recruit our injuries and they will not, which will cripple their offensive capability. I missed the first part of this, but we started a siege on a weakly defended castle. I wanted to test out the offensive ballista, and I have to say they are quite fun, but very inaccurate at long range. Usank is ours, and we lose only 43 troops in the process. Up next, Chadas. It's their southernmost holding, and it will be difficult to defend given its location. They have a respectable 450 defenders, so we must proceed with caution. We opt for trebuchet this time and quickly destroy the defending engines. Our engineer reaches level 125, and we take four men for the trebuchet accuracy. This is the worst part about fighting against Blandia. I need to adjust my timing. We sneak past the troops blocking the gatehouse and have some fun with flanking. We lose 85 troops, but destroy over 400 and take the town. Since this is the first major Vlandian fief we've captured and we don't have any Vlandian nobles, we hired Freduna from the tavern and handed Charas over to her. As you can probably guess, if it weren't for my wife, I probably would have named my kids Child 1 and Child 2 for convenience and ease of use. The enemy scampers off as usual, not wanting anything to do with Chadrick the Great. The vote for Charas comes and a couple nobles are supporting our new hire, so it's only costing us 20 influence to pass. So far, we have three companions that were promoted to a noble, one for Empire, Vlandia, and Asurai each. They try to siege back Usank Castle, but it won't last long as we have three times their number. The battle was a complete massacre with only 21 losses on our side and over 300 on theirs. While we were topping off on local recruits, a mass of enemy parties is spotted to the east. They are making a beeline for Charas, so we head back to stage a defense. Once we garrison inside, they turn back and our ally is now in danger. We reach 175 scouting and take Beast Whisperer for the chance to snag rare mounts 
while moving on the map. Over the course of a year, you can easily accumulate several rare mounts with this perk, which will help significantly for mounted combat. The enemy army retreats back into their territory, so we shadow them. If they return to Chados, they have enough troops to take it back, so it would be more efficient to fight them in the field. Their army retreats further back, giving us the opportunity to siege down Sargo unopposed. After a couple days, we are greeted by two armies totaling 1,250 troops. Luckily, we finish our ram and begin the assault. One risk we run when going into a siege with a single siege engine is losing it to Onager volleys. We lose several troops in our ram in one volley. Yikes. In a crisis like this, we can either concede defeat or take charge and lead from the front. So up the ladder we go. We get to the top just before the horde arrives and we run to the gatehouse for a better choke point. We can silence the Onager for a few moments, but we won't last long there, so further back we push. The horde is now committing to the chase and we must retreat upstairs to have a chance at survival. Every soldier that chases us is one less to defend the walls, allowing our men to pour in. Only a few soldiers follow us upstairs and they soon regret their decision. Now we must thin the enemy so that our men can take possession of this section of the walls. By the end of the siege, we lose only 22 troops, but 141 injured thanks to their onagers. The keep falls without any loss, and Sargo is ours. The enemy outside the gates split up, with one going north to retreat, and the other south to siege down Chadas. Friduna shows up on the vote, fortunately, and we can hand Sargo off to her. At this point, we have run our companions into the ground and need a moment to recoup. The peace deal is relatively cheap, 1200 dinars per day and 540 influence. The war with Landia was a costly distraction, and we can only hope our nobles fall in line with the goal of the kingdom, eliminating Asurai from the map. After a brief respite, we declare war on Asurai and begin the siege on the crown jewel, Sanala. This town frequently reaches prosperity levels of over 10,000 and will be a great addition to our kingdom. The town is well defended, but we brought extra troops this time and outnumber them by nearly 1,000. By the time our siege engines have reached the walls, we have taken significant casualties, the majority of which are injuries from Onager. We scaled the siege tower just in time to sneak past the defenders. Our objective is to silence as many Onager as we can, limiting our injuries. We make it up the stairs and dispatch the two operators, then switch to bow to silence a second Onager. We toss a few rocks down on the defenders below, but unfortunately the Onager ammunition doesn't cause splash damage and downs only a single enemy at a time. They try to operate the other Onager again, but we make quick work of them. The enemy commander scales the tower to personally put a stop to our rampage, taking us down to nearly zero with a mace. We block his final blow and put him to rest. Like a true warrior, he goes down with his town. They send more troops to operate the Onager, but we dispatch them as well. That is until we take an arrow to the guts and go down. We sustain a huge amount of casualties nearly even with the enemy, but two-thirds of which are injuries. The keep has fallen, and the jewel of the south has passed into the rightful owner's hands. Finally, Yasid shows up at the top of the vote, and we pass it along to him, making him a very wealthy man. Not long after, they send a small force of 500 troops over the bridge into Prussian territory. They are a bit faster than we are because of the Desert Moosby penalty. Of course, they siege Ein Balik right in front of us, making them an easy target. It's Unkid himself. Capturing here will be a huge blow to their ability to defend their lands. The battle was very lopsided, and we take several enemy nobles into custody. After a few days rest, we head south to Askar, the town of Asurai Mounts. It's not nearly as well defended as Sanala, but for some reason we take heavy casualties. We lose nearly 300 troops and 650 injured, but nonetheless, the town is ours. We head northwest to finish off the last fief on this side of the river, Barinhal Castle. One of our kingdom's nobles is locked in battle with what appears to be the last of the Asurai army. We rush to their aid and swing the balance of power in our favor. The battle was very lopsided, allowing us to easily transition to sieging the castle. We have quite a few injuries still, which shouldn't be a problem as we just destroyed another army. As luck would have it, the Asurai are able to field another 1100 strong army only days after losing several thousands of troops. We have only a single siege tower completed, but it should be more than enough. We lose 42 troops in the assault and none in the keep battle. As expected, the enemy runs off to siege down a lesser defended fief, so we run to stop them. Their initial 1100 troops are quickly dwindling during the assault, and we will still have over 300 troops for defense. We let the garrison deplete down to 100 troops and then move in for the save. In typical Asurai fashion, they send their skirmisher cavalry forward to harass our infantry. We place them in square formation with archer support close behind and move our cavalry back to draw them in. Troop, move!
They take the bait and we give the charge command. They lose their entire detachment in less than a minute. In desperation, they order a full frontal assault on our position. We order the counter charge from our shield wall and decimate their forces. This army only hours ago stood strong at 1100 and is now wiped out at the cost of 77 troops and a few militia from Sanala. They underestimated our patience and it cost them everything. Literally the same day, another army of nearly 900 crosses the bridge and makes their way into our lands. They are desperate to take Sanala back as their empire is in the throes of death. Unfortunately for them, we have support this time. Apis is here with 680 troops, allowing us to have the numbers advantage. We don't want to engage them out of range of Apis, so we do the Bandlord campaign map dance until our position is just right, allowing us to join forces. Our starting position is decent with a narrow flat land to fight on. However, we have the ability to deploy across the river. Since we have ranged superiority, they will have to either take casualties until we run out of ammunition or cross the river at a couple of tiny choke points. Neither option is good. They decide to exchange ranged volleys with our troops, which will prove a costly mistake. They send a long slender line of infantry across the wooden plane into our shield wall, taking shots from our archers the entire time. We push them back to their side of the river and finish off the stragglers. Thanks to a favorable map and superior ranged troops, we manage close to a 10 to 1 KDR, keeping the majority of our army intact to continue the push. We cross the river and begin the siege of Medini Castle. The three siege engines allow us easy access nope. to the interior and we quickly take the castle sustaining 41 losses. The Asurai have lost close to half of their holdings now and they struggle to stem the tide. After disbanding our army to allow them to recover, we get notice that Medini Castle is being sieged down. The garrison is weak and we likely don't have enough troops to deal with the field battle, so we allow them to begin the assault and then sneak in to help the defenders. The balance of power is heavily in our favor and the enemy has no siege towers, making the defense all but guaranteed. As expected, we lose six troops in total, three of which are from our party. Ayakis is only half a day's travel to the south, meaning we can easily retreat back to Medini for defense if need be. At this point, they can barely muster 500 troops to defend, but they will need much more than that to break the siege off. With the rest of our army finally here, we can begin the siege. The gates are breached and we urge the men forward. The victory! Well, that was short-lived. One enemy seems to be stuck in the wall, so we have to retreat to finish them off, but we lose roughly 200 troops to take the town. Immediately after the siege, one of our allies is caught raiding and we spring into action to help. They are heavily outnumbered, so we opt to auto resolve, losing only 35 troops. Another 500 man army snuck by to siege down Medini, so we head there to relieve them. Thanks to the disorganized speed debuff, we can easily catch up with them. This scene reminds me of the movie The Last Samurai. They went down bravely fighting for their homelands. Another 50 troop loss to defeat over 500. Our surgeon finally reaches level 200 medicine and we take physician of the people to increase the survival rate of our lower tier troops. The other perk is for governor only and we'd be wasted since we need him in our party at all times. Next on the chopping block, Kasira. Our nobles have called a vote for peace with the Asurai again. We don't want to spend the influence to oppose it so we need to finish the siege before the vote. With only six hours left before the final, we begin the assault. We quickly overtake the defenders at a cost of 100 troops and none for the keep battle. Now we can safely take the 
peace deal, giving everyone in the kingdom a chance to recover their losses. To recap the second war against the Asurai, we took Berihal Castle, Sanala, and Askar to the west, and secured everything on that side of the river. Then we crossed, took Medini Castle, Ayakis, and Casita shortly after. They have only a handful of fiefs left, and we should be able to deal the final blow in the next war. Sturgia decides they want a piece of us, and declare war. They have nearly one-third the size of our forces, and some of the poorest fiefs in Calradia, so it shouldn't prove to be more than a nuisance. So I'm not sure exactly why they even declared war on us, as we don't have any fiefs bordering their lands. Omor is the closest, but there are quite a few empire fiefs as a buffer. I forgot to hit the record button, but not long after the start of the Sturgeon War, Asurai declared war on us, so we headed back south and continued our rampage. We have a significant numbers advantage over every kingdom now, so we don't have to worry about numbers as much. Husan Folk is now ours, and we can head south to further squeeze the Asurai into nothing. Up next, Shibal Zumur Castle. This siege barely lasts four minutes, the majority of which was spent pushing the siege towers into place. Truly, the Yasserai are on their last legs at this point. We vote for ourselves to take Husan Folk with plans to either promote another Yasserai companion or donate it to our existing Prussian desert clan. On our way south, we spot an Yasserai army heading to siege back what they lost recently. They get caught and held in place by an ally, allowing us to catch up. Three minutes later, it's all over. I can't imagine the Yasserai being able to recover from this. Tamna Castle is next on the list and has a laughable 26 troops in their garrison. They must have recently lost the fief and taken it back as they have zero militia present. We lost zero troops in the auto resolve and moved further south. Not wanting to deal with ballista in the assault, we make a few trebuchet and clear them out. We lost very few troops in the assault thanks to that decision in Razi is ours. Husan Folk didn't have any Asurai companions available, but Razi does and we hire him immediately. We start by giving him Husan Folk in hopes that he will show up on the vote for Razi as well. Unfortunately, he doesn't, but we are and we vote for ourselves simply to donate it to him afterwards. Imagine going from broke to owning two massive towns in a single day. They are starting to siege back some of the recent conquests to the north, but with the end being so near, we decide to push further south so that we can clear them with a final sweep at the end without having to ping pong back and forth to chase them around. They can have their castles back for a short time. Having remembered what happened last time, we cover the kill hole to avoid being squished by a rock. With reasonable losses, we take the castle and press southwest. It doesn't look like they took any anything back in the north, sparing us the time and effort taking them back. The Sturgians are sieging down Resos castle in the far north, but one of our allies is headed there now to help. Okay, for real, we're nearing the end of the Asurai as they can hardly muster 150 troops into an army. They are too fast for our huge army to catch, but the damage they can inflict is minimal too. They are down to three fiefs, almost there. Another army is coalescing around Hubyar, but we are too big to catch them, and Kasira is just ahead being sieged down, so we take a detour to relieve them. They're too fast for us as well, but luck is on our side and the army splinters off into pieces due to lack of cohesion. So we run with it and smash their army into the ground. I know I've said this before, but this should be the final nail in the coffin for the Asurai. I'm not sure how they can recover 700 troops with no fiefs left. Level 275 athletics is here. Time for our HP pool to skyrocket allowing us to fall off of more siege towers. For 150 tactics, we take call to arms, since the increased move speed will help some when gathering our troops. Time to retake Ayakis. Well, it worked last time, but this time we forgot to jump. Nonetheless, we take Ayakis back. This move is similar to herding sheep. We want the enemy army inside the town so we can safely siege them down without having to defend or retake other fiefs afterwards. Given the size of the enemy garrison, we opt to make trebuchet and clear out the enemy siege engines. There is no need to breach the walls since we have rams and siege towers ready to go. We got on a bit of a rampage once through the gates, cutting down everyone in our path.
These cowardly archers pick us off from afar, but the damage is done and we take the town. With the losses on our side of 139 to their more than 900, the battle was a complete disaster for them. So many tiny parties to deal with now. It's like watching ants disperse. Now the real fun begins. Vlandia declares war on us once again. Rather than splitting our focus in three directions, we spend 6,500 dinars per day and 820 influence to sue for peace. Hobiar is being sieged back and we have to deal with Jamaya Castle, the last Asurai holdout with 900 defenders. Given the success from our previous siege, we opt to build trebuchet to lighten the casualties sustained. There goes the last of the Asteroid Nobles. And of course, we ran out of disk space. The perk guides stick up to 300 gigs each, so it's no wonder. This was the last score check I had before it went dark. But needless to say, we were winning it handily. Level 200 scouting, we are so close to 225. Neither perk is that good, but we take hideout detection range. The last of the Asteroid Nobles are trying to take Hobiar back. They begin the siege and their numbers rapidly drop. Monchug, go away. We will deal with you later. They only want 2,900 dinars per day, making it an easy choice. The 820 influence does hurt though. With less than 150 troops left, we step in to end their misery. For a kingdom that was once so mighty. It's sad to see how far they've fallen. We lose four troops and close out this chapter of the World Conquest. The Asurai finally concede defeat and pay us 120 dinars per day in tribute. And because we were in such a brutal struggle, we sue for peace with Sturgia as well, spending 756 influence to do so. Our nobles need time to drink, feast, recover, among other things. Who will be the next victim of this unstoppable Prussian onslaught?